I'm Karen McNeil, author of The Wine Bible and editor of the digital newsletter, Wine Speed. I'm coming to you from the Napa Valley, live uh, from my kitchen, in fact. Um, and I am so glad you're here because this is a live virtual tasting with a man who makes some of the most extraordinary Chardonnays in, in I was going to say in the Napa Valley, but actually in all of California. Lee Hudson is going to be our guest, and Lee is not your typical grape grower, vintner, or winemaker. In fact, um, I, I kind of think he's worthy of a PBS documentary. He's quite a fascinating uh, man, and a man who, as you'll see, is to agriculture, to farming, and to viticulture. So again, thank you for being here. If this is your first time having a a live virtual tasting with us, welcome. And if you've joined us for others, welcome back. And I remind you that um, the question button is at the bottom of your screen. We'll be taking questions for Lee um, throughout our presentation today. So let's get Lee on the line. Lee, are you there? There you are. There I am, thank you. Hello, good day. E excellent. So, um, Lee, we're going to taste your very impressive wines here in a minute. I've been busily taking notes on them. Um, but your story is too fascinating not to address right off the top. So I, I just want to say to all of our viewers that, um, you know, Lee grew up in a Texas oil family um, and it was a wealthy family. You could have had a bit of a different life, um, suffice it to say, uh, perhaps a, a more, I don't know, ritzy kind of life. Um, but there was something about agriculture that seemed to have just grabbed you that, that was captivating. What was it about agriculture and farming that you found so captivating? Well, I think it's the same thing that's attracted a lot of people to agriculture and uh, to growing things. The this agrarian dream, um, a sense of community, a sense of culture, a sense of place, the um, growing things and producing things with your hands is a tremendously satisfying and rewarding um, endeavor. And it, uh, it, it really spoke to me as a young man. Uh, in, my, in my early teens, uh, I uh, planted gardens, my high school, uh, last quarter was on gardening. And uh, so I, it, it's always been about growing things for me. I, I'm, st I'm still fascinated by growing all sorts of things. It, it, it grapes has been my most complete endeavor, but growing things in general has been tremendously engaging to me. You know, when I've heard you, Lee, talk about um, agriculture and farming, and as you say, growing things in the past, it almost feels to me as if growing things is an art for you, that it is, um, it's like creating a painting or creating a, a piece of furniture or that there's, that there's art involved. Is, is that saying it too, I don't know, too grandly or do you think about it that way? I love art. I think of, of uh, agriculture and growing things as a craft. Um, I, much like uh, the old masters were not really artists, they were craftsmen. They, would, they could be goldsmiths and jewelers and painters and sculptors. I see agriculture as a craft. It takes thousands of hours to get good at it. They say 10,000. Um, and I think that's about what it takes. It takes maybe that and more. And we get we get one season to do it. It's, it's, a, it, it's it, you log into it in a very kind of seasonal component to it, which is uh, very satisfying, very calming, and, and, and um, gives one a, a, a lot of um, time to reflect. Indeed it does. Yeah. <laughs> now, Lee, you bought uh, the land that would become Hudson Ranch um, at 2,000 acres, actually, at a time when there were more sheep, I think, in Carneros than there were people. 
tell us about creating Hudson Ranch. What did it take? Did you just one day look out over a wilderness and say, this one day is going to have is going to be an extraordinary vineyard? Well, I think like most of us, uh, it, it, it seems it, looking back that it was all planned and it was so obvious. But I, I have to say it was one, uh, one um, heel in front of toe, one step at a time. Uh, so we, we did buy the ranch in 81. Uh, it was 2000 uh, undeveloped acres. It had been vineyards in the, in the 19th century. It was actually the home of the, the largest uh, private vineyard in Napa County in, in, the, in uh, 1860. Uh, it had fallen into neglect, held by uh, absentee landowners for investment purposes. Uh, it was a down market. I had some, some, some resources that I decided that would be better spent doing that than anything else I could possibly think. And uh, we were fortunate that the price was right and the time was right. Carneros had not become um, an appellation at the time. It was, it was still a part of the, a singular, singularly part of the Napa Valley. In fact, the Napa, the Napa Valley appellation was still being discussed. It was Napa County grapes at the time. And where the Napa Valley ended and where it, in, where it's, where it began wasn't totally determined. Carneros became an appellation in 1983. And I was very much involved in that discussion. Um, and Carneros was, was dairies and cow-calf operations. And uh, I think there was 150 acres of grapes in Carneros mm -hmm. at the time. So things have changed, uh, I would have to say, uh, for the better. So, yes, but, um, you know, most people would consider that an enormous risk. Um, were you, I mean, I hate to ask it this way, but were you confident? I mean, you took a very big risk there because you're right. Carneros was not proven territory, at least not for grapes. I suppose I was young enough to be confident. Uh, I was 29. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we, uh, uh, I have a group of kids and uh, I love their youth because they, they, they know it all. And I, I was probably confident really basically based on my inexperience uh, more than uh, I, the number of mistakes I made clearly indicated that uh, I shouldn't have been so confident, but uh, <laughs> we, it did turn out. I, I, I was very, I was very nervous. I, it was, but ultimately I've, I've, I've always seemed to land on my feet. Um, and so I had the confidence of that, uh, but no, I didn't know where I was going. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy where I've ended up, but I, I don't know that I really knew exactly where I was going. Well, for viewers who are listening, let me say that um, Hudson Ranch not only produces its own wines, which we'll be tasting here in a second with Lee, uh, but there are three dozen famous wineries in Sonoma and Napa that vineyard designate their wines as coming from Hudson Ranch grapes. It's uh, a mark of real specialness to have those grapes. Um, and then the ranch also is well known for heritage, raising heritage pigs, heritage lambs, olive oil, vinegar, honey, vegetables. There's, I don't think there's any aspect of agriculture you're not in. Maybe cattle, I don't know. Lee. It's a very big integrated farm, isn't it? Yeah, the, the uh, uh, heterogeneous polygamous agriculture has always been something that's fascinated me. It's having everything growing together um, and uh, producing many different things. The, one of the things that we've been most dedicated to is, is uh, the people we work with, uh, not just our clients, but also our employees. Um, and we have an enormously talented employee, a number of employees that um, many of them have been with us for, for over 35 years. And um, we, we, we owe them a great deal of, of, of debt. My wife, Christina, and I uh, has started a, um, 
I'll, I'll diverge a little bit away from what we produce, but I want, one of the things we're most proud of is that we have a, a, um, a scholarship program for our, our employees' children. And we have, a, we have several graduates right now. We have a graduate out of the engineering program at Davis from one of our employees who makes us very proud. But without our employees, we wouldn't be able to do and grow all the incredible things we do. One of the most fascinating things we grow is giant pumpkins. Uh, so last year we grew the largest pumpkin in the state of California here at the ranch. It was 2,047 pounds. So it was uh, um, over a ton. So we proud ourselves on growing very, very small grapes and very big pumpkins. <laughs> that is perfectly said. Well, let's, um, let's taste. We have three of your Chardonnays that we want to taste today. And um, we're going to start with the Hudson Ranch Chardonnay, the 2018. This is your Carneros bottling. And I have to say that tasting this a minute ago, I thought there is no way that Lee Hudson does not think a lot about texture. Because this wine is creamier than cream is. Am I right on that? I, I, I sense it, it, it. So the, 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 uh, the, the 2018 wine is, a, is an estate barrel selection from four different vineyards on the ranch. All from, the, all three of the wines we're gonna taste have something very much in common in that they're all estate, they're all from the, the Hudson Ranch, but they're also from these heritage selections of Chardonnay, which are, Right. Are, are very small berry, very early maturing, and have great natural residual acidity, which is what's important to our, one of the singularly most important parts of our wine style is great natural acidity. Uh, I think of the first wine as layers, because it is representative of four different sites. It, 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 is, it, it really is the, the Hudson style shown as what the ranch can do as a, as a composite of, of our best Chardonnay vineyards. So we have to say what the Hudson style is because um, not everyone will know that. I mean, uh, if you taste three of your wines, you'll know that right away. But I would say, and I know I'm gonna be mad with myself for being internally referential because I, I don't always like it when people do this, but if you do know Merceau, Burgundian Merceau, meaning very golden, very rich, um, very long, very deep uh, white Burgundy, I would say that Hudson is in that style. It's not sleek, it's not lean, it is um, languorous, voluptuous, those kinds of words come to mind. Would you, would you agree with me? Yes, I think that's our, our target. Uh, we're, we're fortunate to have um, this, the Côte d'Or, the, the southern part of the Côte d'Or uh, in Burgundy as, a, as a, a wine style to emulate. We, we, we are not Burgundian, we are Carnarvon, but the styles are, are really or originate from a 19th century winemaking style that, that it is about natural winemaking at its, at, its, at its most simple form. There's nothing added. There's just things removed. And it's, it involves um, full malolactic, which I think is, is driving point of one of, of the wines, and also sorely aging. So uh, the, the wines sit on their primary, primary um, sediments for as long as 22 months. And wow, that is time. what gives it that width and that breadth and the, 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 the roundness and length, which is the hallmark of these wines. Yes, and describing, um, exactly describing what Surly or even Batonage, stirring of the lees um, is, uh, can take a few minutes, but suffice it to say for now, that the impact on flavor and texture is significant in the impact on flavor being 
a sense of um, yeastiness and deep complexity and the impact on texture being this very um, uh, soft creaminess. But you, you have an interesting advantage because you're making these creamy rich wines in a cool area. And, um, and so you also get that really nice, you know, bright acidity running up through the middle of the wine. These wines without their natural acidity would, 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 uh, would personify flabby Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. These are, I, I, I describe them sometimes as blousy with good abs. They, they have great <laughs> musculature and, um, but they, 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 they really do have this very outward expression of joy and an uplifted spirit. Um, but they have musculature and length mm. and that mm. without that musculature and that, and the acidity, we would be, uh, they would be uninteresting. And that yeah, comes from these selections of Chardonnay that we've made. And that, I think that's, it's the, the grapes are the actors. The winemaking is the scene in the play. Yes, uh, I think um, that is, you know, it's a point that we perhaps sometimes forget, especially with Chardonnay, because people talk about how they make it. But I know you have spent um, decades really concentrating on how you grow it and what you grow. And um, I've, I've read that you have nearly 20 different selections, meaning pools of different genetic material, all just to make these small production Chardonnays. It's the essential component of maintaining the complexity. Um, the, um, these wines are about complexity and about layers. And so we do multiple harvests of multiple selections in multiple sites. Um, the, that, that is the essence of the estate wine. Three years ago, we started making individual vineyard specific wines or vineyard designated wines that are barrel selections out of the estate wine. So they're the individual examples of what a singular vineyard does. And that concept is really the, the, what was, was the hallmark of my education in, in Burgundy in that how magnificent a singular site can be. Mm. The singular wines are not better, they're just examples of a differentiation and a, 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 an individual uh, vineyard site. Now, is that the case, Lee, with the next wine that we're going to taste is your little bit. I love this name. I'm hoping it's named after some little person, as in a little child somewhere. It is, it is named um, after my grandchild, um, uh, Elizabeth Little Bit Hudson. And uh -huh. um, it is, it is a, uh, it's a singular vineyard. It's um, on the home ranch. Um, and it uh, is a shot lengthy selection that uh, has been, you know, worked through our program over the last 35 years and is, um, I see a little bit as being very tightly wound and very mineral. And mm. it, it, it is, um, it, it has a, uh, uh, a, an athleticism to it, um, that, um, gives it this minerality, which is a word that's kind of thrown around a lot, but it does mean something of, of, um, kind of flinty, but at the same time long. And, and it's, it's got, um, great, um, sinew. Ooh, sinew is such a good word. Um, you know, minerality is, um, as you point out, uh, it doesn't have one definition. And in fact, it's, um, thank goodness, part of what makes wine mysterious. I always believe that um, 
you know, I hope we never know everything about wine. When people say they want to demystify it, I think, no, please, no, leave, leave a lot to mystery. <laughs> it's, it's better when there is mystery. But um, one thing that minerality, one of the permutations of it that is sometimes talked about, uh, I think this is an important permutation, is that it gives wine, in a sense, a sense of saltiness. Um, not actual salt, of course, because there's no sodium, no Na in, in wine. But it does for wine what salt does for food, which is to kind of electrify the flavors around it. Um, and I get a lot of that sense in a little bit. Um, it's really uplifting to all of the rich um, flavors around all that minerality in the wine. And that's, and that's because of the site. It, 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 we've been, we, we've been, this wine has gone into the estate wine for 15 years and it has always demonstrated this character. Uh, and it's still exhibited in the estate wine. We just bring out uh, uh, six barrels out of the out of the blend for for this bottling and leave it in barrel for another year. Um, but the the site, for whatever reason, and that's what's so beautifully magical about about wine growing and wine making, is that. Sight is everything. It is, it is, it's remarkable when you start paying attention to it and give it its credence. Um, I'll say that when I started growing grapes in the 80s, I made sure that I would be a custom farmer for the buyers that I worked with. And what we really worked at, the winemaker and I would work at, is staying in the same site year in and for many years, for so, for example, John Consgard has been in the same site since 1983. And so we're starting to get to know the site. And yeah. it, we're just getting to know it. And uh, that's really important if we want to make this transition into this kind of grand cru world, which, you know, yeah. we, we see our brethren in France and in Italy that have been going for hundreds of years in the same place. Um, but paying attention really helps and, and repeating it over and over again. So the flavors we see in little bit are in fact flavors that it demonstrates due to sight. All three of the wines are made in the exact same way. So it almost, um, it almost, um, you can, it almost allows one to see how you can talk about the personality of a place. And of course, you mentioned John Consgard, one of the truly great winemakers of the Napa Valley. And I know he was a colleague or a classmate rather of yours at UC Davis when you were in the Viticulture and Enology program um, together. And he is certainly, as you are, um, one of the great masters of Chardonnay. I want to remind everyone listening that we are taking questions, that there's a question button at the bottom of your screen. And um, we just had um, a Meg uh, write in to say that she loved the description of, of saltiness. Um, I can tell she's a food person. Food people really get that. Um, so Lee, let's go to Ladybug because I think uh, Ladybug herself is um, watching. And um, this is a, a, an affectionate term or maybe a nickname for Christina, your business partner, who is also your wife. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Ladybug, uh, Christina Ladybug Sa uh, Salas Boris Hudson. Um, and um, she, so this, this, this vineyard, is, is, is similar genetic material. Uh, again, heritage selections of, of, of Chardonnay from, from, from old vineyards that we have gone into. And it is on, on the Henry Road side of the ranch, which is about, about a mile away from, from Little Bit. Um, and it's made in the exact same fashion as Little Bit and is distinctly more robust. Um, and uh, and it is for year in and year out. That's what it is. Uh, and it it um, it's it's got the great liveliness, 
but it's it's uh it's it's roasted nuts and robust um kind of um it, it's uh it, it's got tons of layers but robust i think of it that that to me is my best description of it yes robust is uh, a terrific word you know i i remember when i lived in new york in um in the 70s and 80s there was on what was then a fairly decrepit Ninth Avenue, there, there were lots of old ethnic groceries, including this wonderful Greek bakery. And every Greek person in New York went to the Greek bakery on this terrible stretch of Ninth Avenue. And two blocks away, you could smell the baklava, the layers of pastry with nuts oh. and honey. And when I taste um, ladybug, I'm always reminded of that, um, that beautiful nutty pastry-like richness. Not that the wine is sweet, because of course the wine isn't sweet. It's getting its richness from, from ripeness, and as you say, from the sight. There's an apparent sweetness to these wines, but they are bone dry. Uh, if they weren't, we wouldn't be able to, to, to bottle them unfiltered, unfined. Um, and so that's kind of like part of, of making these, these wines that are so naturally made is that you have to leave them so that they, they, the finished product is absolutely stable and can be, yeah. and not have to be sterile filtered and it can be just simply uh, cleared by racking and bottled unfiltered on fine, which is important to the, 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 the mouthfeel of the wine. Yes, Lee, we have a lot of questions coming in. And, and first of oh. all, I also have to say that a lot of comments are saying ladybug, exclamation point, exclamation point. It's um, <laughs> turning out to be a big hit in this tasting. But um, one viewer has written in quite a, a good um, question, I think, which is, did your estate wine, did your estate Chardonnay change when you began to take out from it the lots that now go into Little Bit and Ladybug? Clearly the estate wine would have changed at that point, right? Our winemaking over the years has, has changed and we, when we do change, we, we try to do it in very small uh, increments so that we, we can really examine what the change is. The, the change that was made when we did vineyard designated wines was that the estate wine ended up being bottled about six months earlier um, and, has, and has less new oak barrels in it. So the, mm. the vineyard designated wines spend 22 months. And I mean, this is, nothing's exact in the, in the, in the wine, in, in agriculture or in winemaking, but uh, the, the aging period for, for, for the estate is 16 months and about six months longer for the vineyard designated mm. wines. And, yeah. and a little bit less new oak in the, in the estate wine. Yes, it, it seems like it. Um, Lee, I want to ask, we have a question coming in about who the largest purchasers are of your grapes. And I want to tack on to that question. Um, I hope this isn't indelicate to say, but have you ever tasted uh, a Chardonnay or another wine um, that is designated on the label as, as Hudson Vineyards or Hudson Ranch and said to yourself, Man, they ruined my grapes. Well, let's talk about the vineyard designation uh, issue. Uh, in, in, in 1994, uh, Helen Turley came to me at, from Marcus and asked if she could uh, buy grapes and vineyard designated. And, and I said, certainly, we'd be honored. These are great. We have a lot of confidence in this block, and we have confidence in you. Um, but what we need to do is grant you a license. And so anybody who uses our name on the label has a, a license from us. And that license has a dollar a year. There's no financial significance to it. But there is, we have the ability to, to taste the wine and, 
and, and request that they not put our name on any particular wine. Wow. And the other thing that's really, and the, the other thing that's really important is that, is that, is that we grant vineyard designations only to sites of distinction. We, we have 200 acres of grapes, 54 different vineyards, uh, 16 different varieties, uh, 34 different buyers. Um, we, each site is not equal. And so we, there, there are sites that we would never grant vineyard designation because they aren't really sites of distinction. Think about it from, a, from, the, from the, the village point of view and the, and the Grand Cru perspective is we have vineyards that we think of as Appalachian grade wine. And then we have, we have, we have sites that we really do think are sites of distinction. And they've demonstrated that through, not through our impressions of the site, but through the actual outcome of the wines. Mm -hmm. So uh, have I, I, you know, I don't think we've had that problem. Um, I recall Bruce Nyers who, who bought uh, Grenache and Syrah from us for years and we tasting, it must've been 2000, uh, and 2002 and I didn't have to say anything because I had, I had enough confidence in Bruce. He declassified the wine himself. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we work with people with the kind of integrity that we have. And so our reputation is the only thing we have. And, and that's why I wanted to license our name. And that um, I never thought that it would have much commercial kind of value, but uh, I didn't want people I've, I've always been a wine grower rather than a grape grower. Uh, so no, the answer to that question is no. And then our largest buyer is, is Rombauer and Duckhorn. And so those are large production wineries. They don't vineyard designate our wine, but they're great partners. They're really good. Uh, great. They have great teams that, that know what production's about and they, and, and we can get, we can sell fruit in a very straightforward arm's length relationship with them. Yeah. Well, they're but both very established buyers. Sometimes our, our smallest buyer is our most important buyer. <laughs> I'm sure that's the case. Yeah. Um, any idea, Lee? Um, I'm wondering this myself, but we also have a question coming in. Um, how for Little Bit and Ladybug, we're tasting the 2017s. And to me... Um, it seems like those wines really need um, this this time because they're extremely concentrated wines, and even as we've been tasting, they've been kind of unfurling in the in the class. But any sense in uh, uh, about how the eighteens, the eighteen little bit, and the eighteen ladybug will compare to these seventeens? 17 was a unique year and that it, it ripened so rapidly. It, 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 it's, it left a very high residual natural acidities in the berry when we, when we uh, picked. We, we were lucky to have the team that we have uh, in night picking um, at, at, by hand uh, with great organization. We got the fruit off in time under the, 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 the heat spells that we had in 17. But uh, what, what, we res what we picked was fruit that was, was fully mature from a carbohydrate perspective, from a potential alcohol perspective, but with very elevated natural acidities. And so the 17s mm -hmm. have this a very kind of um, uh, distinct high acid. The 18s is one of the, 17 may be the most difficult year I've ever grown grapes in, and 18, maybe the easiest year. Uh, it, it was, it was a, a fruitful year and it was it, like everything went just like you wish it would. The, the vines were finally out of the drought. They'd had a great year of rain, beautiful shoot growth, a beautiful flower, and then an absolutely perfect harvest when you could choose exactly when you wanted to pick it. The, uh, Mother Nature did not rush us. We could wait. We, we took our time to pick. The wines in 18 are, are round, rich, and beautifully proportioned. Um, 
it, it's it's a, just an easy. It was an easy year in the vineyard, and it was it's they're easy wines. Uh, mm. uh, the, so the the eighteen little bit and ladybug were bottled uh, on the thirteenth of May, just this last thirteenth and fourteenth, and uh, I was super excited about it. In fact, we have a new vineyard designated wine in 18 called Seashell from a vineyard that is the only sandy vineyard that we have and uh, actually has these big uh, fossilized seashells in it. And uh, it, 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 it has a very distinct character of its own. So it, it, it's a, uh, so the, the question, I'm not sure if I answered the question, uh, Karen. Uh, yeah. But I, well, let, I, me, I, let me ask you something very specific here, because we have uh, some other questions coming in yeah. uh, as well, which is, um, I assume that both, and again, lots of people are just loving these Chardonnays. Um, I assume, though, that Little Bit and Ladybug are made in um, small quantities, under 200 cases or so. What are those uh, quantities? About 150 cases each. I, I don't have the exact figure, but it's about 150 cases. Um, the they they are they they're sold exclusively online. They're not sold uh, uh, in the marketplace in, in wholesale. The the state wine is a wholesale wine, um, and the and the uh, the vineyard designated wines are sold here at the winery and 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 our on our um, on our website. So the the very limited production. There's the the seventeen estate has. 1500 cases and so there's about 150 cases of two of the two vineyard specific mm. wines or mm. vineyard designated wines yeah and um you know i i know people always want to know about or often want to know about oak treatment um to me i feel like whether someone tells you 18 months or 22 months is less important than whether or not you you sense it in the wine, whether or not it stands out awkwardly from the wine. Um, I'm happy to say that in all three of these wines, it seems to me the oak is very integrated. But I'm curious too, um, we've got one um, viewer who has asked um, how long these wines have spent in oak because they almost seem like they might have spent longer than you would even imagine because the oak is so beautifully integrated. Yeah, the, 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 the funny thing about oak treatment is that the, the longer a wine spins in oak, the more, the less, it's, less oaky it is. When, when yeah. you taste these wines it, it, uh, after they're malolactic in their first, first six months, they really, the, the oak is sitting right on top. And, and is, it, but the integration of it happens uh, during time. That, that's why the estate has less new oak because it, it has less time to integrate. Uh, these wines would be distinctly different if they didn't have that oak. There's a polished component to them. The, mm. the, the kind of the, the um, Time is really essential to, as you increase the amount of, of, of new barrels. So we use, we use three-year-old, two-year-old, uh, and, and, and one-year-old barrels, or, or let's go zero, I mean, new, one-year-old, and two-year-old barrels for these ones. Um, mm. And uh, I think it's important, the, 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 for the style, I think that that's, that's, that's important. We, Ten years ago, we used higher percentages of oak than we do today. We're probably five, five percent to ten percent less in the vineyard designated wines, and and half as much in the in the estate wine. Wow. Well, it's, these wines certainly did not, um, you know, uh, no voluptuousness was was lost by doing that because the fruit is so um, just plump, I guess, in them. And I'll never forget your, your description of blousy, but with great abs that I can, <laughs> I can see that person in my mind. Um, so Lee, thank you so much for, for joining us on Taste with Karen Live. This has been um, 
just a really interesting segment to to get to know these wines um, with through the lens of how you think about them and the importance of how they're they're grown. For anyone who loves small production Chardonnay and um, and really exquisite richness in Chardonnay, these are those wines. So I'm very grateful to you for joining us. Thank you again. And thank you to all our viewers. Um, and we will see you on a, uh, another episode of Taste with Karen Live next week. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And thanks, Lee and Christina. It's been my pleasure. And Christina sends her best.